I'm from IAG. I can't speak about other insurance specific policies, but hopefully I can help to explain the insurance process a bit more for you. I've been through the cash settlement process myself as a homeowner as well. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about are more tips about what you might think about rather than here's our insurance policy and this is how it responds. So... Um, as Brian said, I've been asked to answer some questions, so I'll go through those and I will be here if you have a question about your insurance that I don't answer during the presentation, I will be here to answer your questions. I think the first thing to be aware of as well is cash settlement is not a new thing, so all insurers have been cash settling claims from the time of the earthquake. The difference now is most policies um, allow us to cash settle at indemnity value, but insurers have worked with reinsurers so that we're now in a position with, that we can cash settle at reinstatement value. So what that means is a cash settlement is based on what can be assessed at the time of the assessment. So what it would cost for us to reinstate your property at the time of the assessment. The important thing there is it's based on what your insurer can see when they do the assessment. So if you have concerns and your insurer can't see those elements that you're concerned about, then you're within your rights to ask for invasive assessments. So if you had a concern about a wall, before you cash settled, you might want them to take that wall down, the wall lining off, to look behind the wall. You can request that because what your insurer is going to want to do is work with you towards a full and final cash settlement and the only way that you're going to have confidence about that is to have that invasive assessment done. So that might also include closed circuit television coverage of your drains, it might include roof reports, asbestos reports. If your house is a certain age, then you'd probably want to request asbestos reports and that's generally houses built in the 60s and 70s where we've seen more asbestos come through. But you can ask for all of those reports so that as your insurer is working up the cost, you know that all of those things are included. It is generally a full and final payment and I say generally because there are some exceptions to that. So again, if you were concerned particularly about your foundation, you might say, okay, well, I'm quite happy to cash settle on the component of my home above the foundations, so what we might call the superstructure, but actually I want a partial discharge because I want to leave the discharge open in case the foundations cost more. The thing that you need to be aware of there is in most full and final settlement, you will have some type of contingency built in because the contingencies are there for costs that we're unaware of at the time. If you have a partial discharge, the contingencies are likely to be taken out because it's one or the other, it's not both. So you would have full and final with contingency or partial without contingency because that allows you to go back and takes away the need for contingency. But the important thing there is it's generally full and final which means that once you've accepted the payment, your claim is closed if you have signed full and final. And so then if you do find things that you are unaware of, you're not able to reopen your claim. So that is the element of risk that you take on there. What we have seen is that most people that cash settle don't rebuild or repair exactly what they had before. So once you start to change your footprint or change things, then you probably don't have that pathway back anyway because it's, it's a lot harder to prove that something has cost more and you should have access to more funds if you've changed what you had before. It's a lot easier if you're just replacing exactly what you had. Um, if you need to move out during your reinstatement, your alternative accommodation payment is included generally as part of your settlement if you haven't used it before. Now, there was a question this afternoon which was a really good one around will it always be included? Where it wouldn't be included is if you, for example, decided to cash settle and you were buying a new home that's already built. So you're not going through that build process and in the unlikely event everything went, went, went um, very smoothly and you cash settled today and moved into your new home today, then actually you're not incurring alternative accommodation costs, so they may not be included. So you would need to have a conversation with your insurer there about what your intention is. The important thing around all of these things with cash settlement is what is your intention and what does a good outcome look like for you? And I would encourage you, before you go into that negotiation process with your insurer, have that in mind. So maybe speak to RAS, the Residential Advisory Service, or speak to your bank and work through with them what does a good outcome look like? Because then you are clear on what you're looking for and you can have those conversations about intention with your insurer a lot more clearly. And that does help. Um, inflation costs have come up a lot, so people ask about why inflation costs are not included 
rooted in settlements. And as Sarah pointed out this afternoon, very rightly, there's two types of inflation. So there's inflation on your assessment. So if your assessment was done in 2012 and you're now cash settling on that assessment, you would be right to assume that inflation would be added from the time of assessment to now. Once you do cash settle, there's not ongoing inflation included. And the reason for that is if you think about it, if you cash settle today, you have that money in your bank. So there might be inflation, but you're also earning interest. So there's not future inflation usually built into cash settlements. But again, if you knew that you were going to build in 12 months, you had your builder lined up, you were going to incur inflation, you could prove that you might want to speak to your insurer about it, or you might want to build that into what time frame you cash settle in. So once you've agreed the scope of damage and the associated cost, some of the things that cash settlements allow you to do are to manage your own project, obviously, in your own time frame. You've probably heard um, media comment recently about insurers' time frames, EQC are down to the last 2% of claims. Everyone has time frames that they're working to. What a cash settlement means is that you're not tied to those time frames. So we have a lot of customers that say, my son's at school down the road, he doesn't finish at that school for another three years, I don't want to rebuild until he's finished school there. That's fine, it's a very valid driver for the homeowner, but for insurers, we won't be here managing repairs and reinstatement in three years' time. So the best way forward for a homeowner is to cash settle that claim now and be able to manage it in their own time frame. It allows you to make additional changes. So again, because as insurers, we need to have time frames around our rebuild and repair programs, most insurers have said, if we're managing your reinstatement, we will manage exactly what you had, but we won't allow you to make any changes. And as a homeowner, that's sometimes against um, the best outcome for you. Because if you've been living in a big five-bedroom house, you now have the opportunity maybe to go to a higher spec three-bedroom house because your life circumstances have changed. That is your um, right to be able to make those changes. But what we as insurers are saying is we don't want to project manage that um, that house rebuild. So we'll again work with you to quantify the loss and pay you the cash settlement so that you can make those changes. Um, it allows you to sell or retain your home and land and rebuild at a different location. So for a lot of customers, that's a good option because they don't have to go through the rebuild process or to sell and uh, or retain the land and buy an existing house at another location. So with any of those options, what we would be saying is right at the very start, have a conversation with your bank because they are all options, but they're all options that if you have a mortgage on the property, the bank will have some advice on. And Mark is here from BNZ, so he'll talk to that briefly later. But that's where we'd say to start. Have a conversation with your bank. Think about those options and which of those options may be attractive. And then you'd start through to work through what do each of those things mean. So if you're going to look at selling or retaining and building at a different location, you'd probably want to speak to your bank, to a real estate agent about what you could sell for, um, what you could buy for, and also your lawyer about what are the legal implications of each of those choices. So one of the questions that came up was, what are the differences between purchasing another property elsewhere and rebuilding on the property when you're calculating a cash settlement? And this comes back to when you are negotiating a cash settlement with your insurer, it is all about your intention. So if you are intending to rebuild on the property, then any costs that you would incur rebuilding on that property would be included. So if it's a TC3 site and you have retaining walls and you have a bridge, then the cost of the TC3 foundation if it's damaged, plus the bridge if it's damaged, plus the retaining wall would all be included in your cash settlement. If you were if you had that TC3 property with the bridge and the retaining wall, but you were going to purchase an existing property somewhere else, those costs wouldn't be included because you're not going to incur them. So it is all about what your intention is at the time. And so that's why I would urge you to, to think about that before you enter into the cash settlement negotiations. And if you don't know what you intend to do, you would probably be better to have that conversation about, at this point in time, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Yes, I do want to cash settle my claim. I may reinstate on on site because if you did decide to reinstate on site and you were going to incur those costs, you'd want to make sure that they'd been included in any type of settlement. So there are differences based on that intention. What's included and excluded in different options does differ as well. So I've touched on the inflation. Project management costs is one that comes up. So People assume that if your insurer is not managing the process for you, you're going to have to take on the role of project manager and that seems a bit daunting for a lot of people. But if you think about it in terms of if you're rebuilding a new home, for example, and you're working with a group home builder, 
if you worked with someone like Orange Homes, they have project managers. So whether you go through an insurer build program with Orange Homes or you deal directly with Orange Homes, you still have to make the same number of choices. So you'll always have a project manager there. You'll still need to decide on the design, the colours, the type of home that you want, and they'll guide you through that process. The difference is that your bank then almost steps into the role of the insurer because they pay the milestone payments to Orange Homes rather than your insurer paying those payments. But in that option, there's not there's not much more in terms of project management that you'd need to do whether you cash settle or you go through an, a, re, a rebuild program. Where you might want project management costs included in your settlement and where you would talk to your insurer about it is if you are going to manage the whole process yourself. So if you're going to have to coordinate tradespeople, if it's a major repair for example and there's not as many coordinated repair builders, you might need to put a lot more work into that yourself. So you might say to your insurer, will you include project management fees because I'm essentially taking on the role of the project manager. And because all of the cash settlements are a negotiation, then that is something that you could negotiate with your insurer. They may or may not include it, but it's something to talk to them about. Foundations should definitely be included if they are damaged. So if you have a TC3 property and you have to reinstate TC3 foundations, then they should be included as part of that settlement. Unless, as I say, you have a partial settlement and your insurer says, we'll put down the foundations and then we'll settle everything above ground, which some insurers are doing. And then experts, expert reports. So on that, I would say we have incurred a lot of cost usually to get to the point of cash settlement, we as insurers. So we've generally gone out, we've got geotech engineering, we've got structural engineering, we've got builders reports. For our new um, cash settlement packs, it costs us approximately $20,000 to get to the point of being able to offer you a cash settlement. And that's because of all the people involved, the asbestos reports, all of those things. If you have concerns about any of the expert reports, ask your insurer to sit down and discuss those reports with you before you go and incur more cost because there's been a lot of cost incurred and if it's just about confidence in those reports, it might be as simple as speaking to an engineer to get that confidence. If you can't do that through the process of working with your insurer, then in many cases, if you go and get your own expert report and that changes the outcome of your settlement, then your insurer will reimburse you for that report. So, for example, if we had an engineering report and you went and our said that it was a repair, you went and got an engineering report that said it was a rebuild, we peer reviewed it and it did change the outcome of the settlement and we said, yep, your engineer is right because of these factors, then we would, re we would settle on that basis and we would reimburse you for the report. So, that's what IAG does, but it's probably worth if you're with another insurer asking that question as well. Or you, you would ask for professional fees to be included in your settlement if that's part of your policy entitlements. So how long does it take to process each of those options? It really depends. It depends on what your intention is and how quickly, what your insurer has available about your property already. So if your insurer has all of those reports, the structural engineering and all of those things, and it's just a matter of discussing dollars, that might take four to six weeks. And that largely that will be driven by you because you will be given a figure, you'll discuss that figure with your insurer, you'd go and speak to your bank, your insurer, your um, lawyer, your advisor, friends and family, you'd do a bit of due diligence and you'd be in that negotiation. If we're starting from scratch and having to go and get all those reports, it's probably about a three month process to get all the, the engineering and the figures that are included in that. And then the outcome of that is dependent on what you choose to do. So if you choose to build a home, we know that on average through our program, it's taking about 47 weeks to build a home. Um, if you buy an existing, obviously it's a lot quicker process. And then another question was around, what if I've already started the process? Do I have to start again? And the answer on that is no. It actually makes it a lot easier if you have already started the process and not to the point that you're in construction, but if you're already speaking to a builder about what your designs might look like, what you want to include, what you don't want to include, the builder is pricing that up. If your insurer then starts to speak to you about cash settlement, Generally, you could get to the point with the builder that they'll do a fixed sum price and then you would cash settle with your insurer on that fixed sum price. The only difference, you keep working with the builder, the money goes to you or your bank and your bank draws down the payments as you go through the, the build process. So you don't have to start again if you're already engaged with the builder. I think Sarah can probably add to that in terms of if your insurer tries to cash settle you part of the way through, um, what can you do about that as well? And again, I would be saying speak to your insurer um, 
and just try and work out an outcome that's best for both parties. In terms of seeking advice, when you do have your cash settlement offer, or even before that, before you'd want to be speaking to your bank and your lawyer, but also speak to your insurer about what in ongoing insurance cover you will have, because you will have some obligations to your bank probably about what cover you keep in place. And if you're a cross lease or a multi-unit building, you will have some obligations to other people in that building. But one of the things to consider is if you are a repair, for example, and your home has a sum insured of $500,000, you cash settle on a repair of $150,000, you will still have cover for $350,000. But your insurer will generally require you to make um, a, an effort to repair that damage within a set period of time to then reinstate full cover. And if you don't do that, they may look to cancel cover altogether. So when you're thinking about if you keep something as is, you do need to think about what are the implications on ongoing cover. And if people have specific um, questions about that, I can answer those later. If you have a broker, speak to your broker as well because they can give you advice around that. And then as I said before, if you're considering any of the options, best to engage with a real estate agent right at the start of the process because they can tell you if you sold it as is, what could you sell it for today? If you repaired it and then sold it, what could you sell it for then if you're intending to sell? Um, if you decide to stay, how long would you need to stay to make the money back on that property? Your real estate agent can help with all of those things. So I'm going to pass on to Sarah now. She's going to talk more about the legal implications of this, the options. And then, as I say, I'll be available for questions afterwards. So, hi, everyone. My name's Sarah Henderson. Um, I'm one of the independent advisors with the Residential Advisory Service. Now, if you haven't heard about us, um, our service provides independent advice about your particular claim. Um, all our independent advisors are practising lawyers that work for Community Law Canterbury. Um, and we're one of many of the services that kind of help you navigate um, the sentiment of your claim. Um, so I would encourage all of you who didn't attend the seminar last week um, to go and watch it online. I think it's unavailable on most of the websites, so CanCern and the Rebuild website. Um, they provide a lot of information about the process um, and Duncan provides some great advice about settling your claim as well. Um, I think one of the most important takeaways from that seminar was that once you get your offer, um, that doesn't mean that that's the end of your claim. Um, you can negotiate from there. Um, and then there are many different ways to try and settle your claim as well, depending on your particular circumstances. Um, Whenever um, our advisors meet with property owners, we ask them two questions. Uh, so the first one Renee was talking about is, what do you intend to do? Um, and the second one is, what is the insurer offering? Um, so these questions will be different depending on if you're a repair or a rebuild. Um, but if, you know, do you intend to actually rebuild or repair? Um, do you want to buy another house? Are you not sure and you just want more information to try and make that um, decision? Um, do you want to just settle and decide later on? Um, because that does colour a lot um, about your settlement options. Um, while we advise policy holders to look first at your policy to see what you're entitled to, um, a lot of the insurers offer different settlement paths as well, not just your legal entitlements underneath your policy. And one of those might be better for you, um, both financially, um, stress-wise, time-wise. Um, so it's important to consider what are those novel paths that the insurer is offering as well. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on reviewing your cash settlement. So what I'm going to assume is that you've got your scope of works, um, you agree with all the um, damage that's been addressed, you agree um, with what the repair or rebuild method is, um, and then you're just deciding um, what you want to do from there. I'm also assuming that you don't want a managed repair or rebuild. Um, as Renee was talking about, um, there is a legal principle there. So if you are already down the path of a managed repair or rebuild um, and you still want that, I would really encourage you to either see our service or see a lawyer about that um, because you might be able to continue down the path even if the insurer is offering you a cash settlement at that stage. Um, so when you're reviewing a cash settlement, you want to make sure that you've got all the information that the insurer has. Um, so this should include the costed scope of works that they're basing your cash offer on, um, all engineering information, so all structural engineering reports, there might be more than one. 
um, all the geotech reports. Um, and remember to get all this information from EQC as well, because they might have additional information that's not there. Um, you'll need your policy as well um, and the policy schedule, both the ones that are in place at the time of the earthquakes. Um, and then you'll need the offer. So it's this stage that you can start getting some professional advice. Um, so you might want to talk to some licensed building practitioners if you're not sure whether the scope's accurate in a repair. Um, you might want to talk to a professional quantity surveyor to check that everything's been included, that it's the right repair rebuild method and the rates are accurate to what you're going to incur if you carry it out. Um, and also um, engineers, so if you're questioning the solution, um, you might want to go and employ your own engineer and say, look, this is what they're suggesting. Does it look like um, this is the right um, repair or rebuild method um, for my particular site? Um, but there are some things that you yourself can check um, have been included. So as Renee was talking about, um, you have to look at what date the costings were made. So you might have a scope um, from a project manager um, at the insurance office that had been done in 2012. Um, then the insurer really should be increasing the costs for the inflation amounts. Um, but you might also have other quotes, um, like they might have employed a roofer to go out on top of your roof, um, and that was in 2013. So you'd have a different inflation rate there, but it should really be included. Um, the next thing that you could check is what professional fees have been included. Um, so even though the insurers carried out geotech and structural engineering reports, you will still need to get an engineer um, to, if there's any kind of foundation element to your repair or rebuild. Um, so they need to make sure that that's enough to carry out what needs to be done. Um, for example, with your geotech, even though they've done the drilling on your site um, and they've identified some options for your property, there's still going to be some um, geotech expenses that you're going to have to incur. Um, when they demolish the house, they'll likely test underneath the property as well because the land performs differently in different areas um, and they might need to do a sign-off, so there's still um, expenses there. Um, and also a structural engineer if you need to design anything, um, if they're designing a foundation for you, you're, you're going to need um, the money for that. Um, so there are other fees as well, professional fees, design fees. So you look at the house that you had, um, was your home architecturally designed? If it was, then you're entitled to architect fees. Um, if your home was a group home, um, you'd still get a draftsman uh, if you, they can't create exactly the same thing. Um, other things as well is project management. Um, I would say it's, it's the house that you had in place at the time, not the house that you intend to build. So if your house is not a group home, um, I would say that you're entitled to those project management fees. Um, other things to look for, um, are the builder's margin. Um, there's only a couple that I've seen that haven't included a builder's margin. Um, it should be around 10%. And that's put on um, usually at the bottom of your scope, um, um, around where the GST is added on. Um, also check that you're, you're given the money to buy contract works insurance as well. Um, so you'll need a different type of insurance policy when you're carrying out a repair or rebuild. Your normal insurance policy won't apply. Um, the next one to talk about is the contingency sum or the percentage. Um, so a contingency sum is basically a recognition that there might be some unexpected costs because they can't investigate everything and accurately assess it all. Um, so usually what it's done is it's when you provided your offer, um, it's usually on one piece of paper, the summary, um, and they'll have the cost of what the scope of works is, and then underneath they'll usually have a percentage of what the contingency sum is. Um, now, there are certain circumstances where that percentage should be higher. Um, so repairs are usually higher than rebuilds because there are some costs there that are unknown. So um, it might be that they didn't investigate the subfloor space. Um, it might be that they didn't get scaffolding and get up on the roof. They gave you a provisional sum for what needs to be done to the roof. Um, in those circumstances, your contingency sum should be higher than for a rebuild. Um, but there are other ways as well um, that you can reduce your risk um, that it's going to cost more. Um, so as Renee was talking about, you might want to do a partial settlement. Um, so you agree with all the above slab costs, um, but when it comes down to checking the geotech results underneath the house and it comes to um, 
choosing what foundation is needed, um, you might want to have an option or a clause in your settlement agreement that allows you to go back to the insurer if it costs more. Um, that's when I'd probably advise you to go to a lawyer to help negotiate that additional clause. Um, but it might be that some of the insurers are drafting some of these clauses at the moment. Um, I know that with Tower, if you are rebuilding the house um, and you're rebuilding exactly what you had before, as if you were in a managed build program, you can return to them if the costs um, exceed what their estimate was. Sorry, um, so with Tower, um, if you're creating exactly the same thing as what your house was before, as if you were in a managed build program, um, you can return to them if it ends up costing more, but it just has to be within the time frame of that settlement agreement. So it's not necessarily full and final for that one. Um, there's also other ways that you can reduce that risk. So you can start doing the investigation now. Um, so you can wait until perhaps you've got a builder chosen um, and you've decided what you want to do. Um, but you'll have to talk to your insurer about that and whether there can be a little bit of a buffer between the time that they've estimated the costs and when you get a build contract in place. Um, so there are other items to check as well. So you want to look at your policy and see what you're entitled to for landscaping. Usually there's um, a sublimit on it, so 2,500 or something like that. Um, so you want to check whether you're entitled to that. Um, I would check your contents as well. Um, if you're a total loss, then EQC will pay the first 20,000. So you might want to start getting some quotes for carpets and drapes. Um, and then the insurer usually comes in to top it up if it ends up being more than that. Um, look at your temporary accommodation as well. Um, different insurers settle this in different ways. Um, so if some of them, they'll pay out your temporary accommodation even if they know that you might be buying another house or you're not sure. Um, others will wait to be sure about what your intention is before they pay out the amount. Um, others want a bit more evidence about um, how much it's going to cost you and how many weeks you'll be out. Um, that's usually with repairs. Um, so you might want to go to some real estate agents um, and see how much it's going to cost weekly for you to be out of the house. And usually I would suggest that you have a buffer as well because even if they've estimated that it's going to be 21 weeks while you're out, um, it's not necessarily going to only be 21. It might extend out. Yeah, so it, it might be smart to try and negotiate maybe an extra three to five weeks for that um, accommodation. Um, so other things to look at as well is the insurer's policy on demolition. Um, if you get the demolition costs where you're thinking about an as-is, where-is sale, um, or if you haven't made the decision yet, I know Southern Response sometimes put in their settlement agreements, if you want it and you haven't decided what you want to do, but you want to settle, um, but in six months' time you decide, actually, I do want to rebuild, or it's better to sell the land with, without the house on it, you can return to them and they'll, they'll demolish the house for you. So it's good to start talking to the insurer about what their policy is on demolition, um, and also salvage as well. Um, so I'll be here um, for quite a while after this, so you can ask me any questions. I'm happy to answer them. Um, yeah, just the biggest takeaway is, is just because the offer's there, that doesn't mean that that's the end of it, and it's natural to negotiate your claim.